So today's talk is going to be about JIT compilers. Before I begin, can I have a show of hands? Who has heard of the term JIT before? All right, that's awesome. Means I can't get away with some BSing. Okay. So today's talk, right? Actually, in order to understand a JIT compiler, what you need to understand is how real compilers, how normal compilers work. So today's talk, sadly for you guys, is not going to be that much about JIT compilers. It's going to be more about how normal compilers work and what JIT brings to the table. We're not going to be talking too much about specific JIT compilers because it can get quite complicated. We're talking about general techniques that they use in principle. So before we begin, who am I? I'm Omar. That's my Twitter handle. I work as an iOS developer at C. Yeah, I'm a normal standard iOS guy. If you're wondering what I'm doing talking about compilers, uh, it's just a hobby. OK, so let's jump in. Why are we talking about this? Why JIT compilers? Now, actually, the reason we're talking about JIT compilers is because of our favorite friend, interpreted languages. Everybody loves interpreted languages. Like, give me a show of hands. How many of you use interpreted languages at work? I'm sure most of you do. Everyone uses Python, right? Python, JavaScript, almost everyone here uses them. And I'm sure most of you feel like this, right? When you're using JavaScript, like, I don't know about how many of you worry about the fun fact, of, how many of you have seen the What movie? Like, you guys know about the funky JavaScript stuff, right? I don't need to uh, elaborate on it. But my point here is, interpreted languages are interesting because the, their performance characteristics are very different. The way they run it is very different compared to compiled languages. They are often known to be slower. Like whenever you talk about Python, for example, one of the things you talk about is, why is Python slow? Why is it slow, actually? If you think about it, why is Python slow compared to C? At the end of the day, it's just assembly code. At the end of the day, it's just machine code that's executing on some CPU hardware. So what makes Python slow? Let's think about this question. In order to answer this particular question, we need to talk actually about compile languages first. So let's talk about compile languages and change the topic. Compile languages. Languages like C, C++, Swift, I'm an iOS guy. How do, how do they get compiled? What's going on? So let's look at what a compiler does. So here I have some C code. Everyone's favorite language, C. The first language everyone starts off with, right? I have some very simple C code here that's showing you factorial, so C source code. Everyone, don't need to read the code. I, I think it's correct. <laughs> But what's the compiler's job here? On the other side, you see some assembly code. All right, You don't need to read that either. I just show it to you to show what it looks like. These are the actual CPU instructions that will execute when you call factorial. Okay. So what's the job of your compiler? Compiler's job is to convert source code, transform it into assembly code. It's just a program. It's like any other software. It's job, it will take source code as input, convert it into these instructions that the machine will execute one by one. That's it. That's, that's its job. How does it do it? This is where it gets a bit tricky. It's actually, it's actually quite complicated. But here's a very, very simplified bird's eye view of the whole process. And those of you who are compiler nuts will be sick of seeing this again and again. But what's basically happening is I have a source file called factorial.c, let's say in this case. I will run through some process where I will do some parse, lexing and parsing. Lexing and parsing just means you take the strings and you convert them into some kind of data structure that makes it easy to operate on. You can't use strings all the time. It's a bit tricky, so we convert it into some internal representation. Usually this is called an AST. And then you will generate code. The thing I want you to focus on today and the thing we're focusing on particularly today is the code generation part. Okay, we're going to generate some, a normal compiler will generate some machine code. And then it will do a shit ton of optimizations on that machine code. And then it will produce to you some binary. It might be executable, it might be some library, etc. We don't care. Okay? This is all happening at compile time. At compile time, you have this nice binary at the end. What happens at runtime? It's very simple. You feed this executable to your CPU. Because it's already all machine instructions, the CPU just has to run it one by one. That's it. There's no additional runtime cost, so to speak, right? It's just literally the instructions that we were specified. A CPU just needs to go through them one by one and do whatever the CPU is, is, do, is doing, uh, like it's designed to do. OK, so that's a simple compiler. But life is great. Like People normally love these compilers. But what's the problem if you have this kind of flow? 
why doesn't everyone just use compile languages, right? Well, first of all, and this is truer back in the 80s and the early 90s, before LLVM became fashionable, compilers were hard to write. It's a fact. It's hard to write machine code. It's hard to optimize and generate machine code that's very like, you know, nice and performant. Believe it or not, even in the 1990s, I was reading this article, game devs avoided the C compiler because it was more performant to hand tune your assembly because GCC was not good enough. Can you imagine such a time? This is not that long ago. Compilers are hard to write. Another pr problem, and this is especially true, like I don't know how many of you do iOS, like Swift, for example, is the big culprit. It takes bloody long to compile. I have a project, I've, I work on this app, we have this app called Shopee. Believe it or not, the build time takes around one hour to compile. See, I'm not joking. It's damn slow. And this is a problem because, you saw, I, saw the, I showed you the flowchart earlier, right? The compiler is doing so much stuff. It's no, it's no, there's no choice. All those crazy optimizations, they cost time. So if you are doing debugging, and let's say you change one line of code, and now you want to try out your app again, shit, I need to wait another hour. Like, okay, I might as well go play out with swords, like, like you don't see the XQCD, right? So it's, like, it's, it's painful. Another big problem with compile languages is, it, the, like I showed to you, the instructions are literally what the CPU will execute. But there's so many different CPUs. There's ARM, there's Intel, there's ARM64, there's ARM v7, there's ARM64e, which came out a few months back. So what CPU architecture, actually? It depends. The compiler will generate for a very specific CPU architecture. And the problem with that is, it's very hard to distribute this thing. Because if you ha I have this binary for ARM64, how do I distribute it? The, the guy who's ha whose phone I'm deploying this iOS app on has an ARMv7 phone, let's say. What I have to do, actually, is I need to combine all the binaries into this what's called a FAT binary. And I need to ship all my our binaries together to work on multiple architectures. And this causes your binary sizes to explode. And this is a big problem. Like, so this is one of the reasons why apps can be quite big in size. Another big problem is different operating systems. If you have different, in op, different operating systems have very, very different environments. They have different binary executable formats, they have different run times, they have different system calls. How do you pass people your binary? If I have made this sexy app and I want people using Windows, Linux, everyone to use my binary, how do I pass it to them? They can't run it because people, all these OSs will have different, will have different requirements. If you use OS X or iOS, the binary format is called Mako. It's completely different from the EXE format that Windows uses, which is completely different from ELF that Linux uses. So how do you port your stuff on different operating systems? It's quite hard, actually. And like I mentioned, slower development cycle. So given all this problems with compiled languages, imagine, I want you to imagine, it's 1996, all right? Your name is Brendan Eich. You are tasked with creating a language in seven days for this thing called World Wide Web. It might hit off in a few years. You never know. Who knows, right? But you have to now build a compiler in seven days. What do you do? What, how, what choice do you have? You're not going to take the compiler out. You're going to ship a binary. You probably write this language called JavaScript and use this other, other technique called, oh, sorry, called interpreters. You write an interpreter instead. So let's look at interpreters now. How do interpreters work, and how is that different from a compiler? An interpreter is very, very simple. Here I have factorial again, the Python code. And I run this Python factorial of py, and I get the answer immediately. This is how you use an interpreter. What's actually happening under the hood? Well, it's very similar to a compiler. It's a wannabe compiler, I like to call it. In the sense that in runtime, what's happening is, now keep in mind, this is runtime, the interpreter will par lex and parse your source code, and it will immediately execute it. Okay? What do you mean? What do I mean by immediately execute? There's no machine code generation involved. That's what I mean. It will execute it in the environment that, that Python, code, Python uh, interpreter is written in. Okay? So here's a fun ex exercise. Let's write an interpreter within a few minutes. And this is a fun fact. This is an interview question we do in one of our, in one of, in our uh, coding interviews in my company. So 
Here I have a very simple programming language that looks like this. I just give you mathematical forms, okay? Some mathematical expressions like 40 divided by 3 plus 75 multiplied by minus 2. I want you to think about how would you design an interpreter for this kind of programming language. And if you think about it, the first step will be to transform this string into some kind of tree, right? Maybe we can call this tree an AST. And you will write some algorithm that will parse the string and convert it into this kind of tree-like thing, right? This is easy. So we're not going to delve into this part. This is the easy part. Let's jump to the execution part. So imagine we already have this tree. I'm going to show you some code now. This code may seem a bit involved, but it's actually very simple. All I have here are the different kinds of forms that are possible in this language. So I can have variables, constants, a summation, difference, multiplication, division, etc. I have this struct to describe a variable. I have a struct to, to describe a constant, which contains a value inside. I have this binary or unary operation, a binary operation that has a left, right, and then I have this node thing. A node knows what type of node it is, and it knows that it is one of these things. It can be either a variable, a constant, a binary expression, or a unary expression. If anyone does not understand this slide, let me know or raise your hand, if you, and, and I'll, I'll keep at this for a while. But this is quite simple. The idea here is we have this data structure that's kind of recursive. It can describe a tree, basically, of something like a tree, right? This is what's called an AST. This, I'm, I'm using C over here because I assume everyone is familiar with C. I didn't want to use Haskell because, yeah, uh, I would use Haskell if I could. Okay, so uh, this is the structure. How do I write, how do I execute this AST? It's actually quite simple. Like, again, interpreted in two slides. I'm sorry, I reduced the font size a bit. But basically what's going to happen is I will recursively go through the tree and execute everything, right? So I recursively go through the tree, and from my expressions, I recursively call the same execution on the left subnode and the right subnode, and so on. And then I do the, and I basically see what kind of expression I am, and based on that, I'll do some evaluation. Like, I don't want you to, I don't, the code here doesn't matter. What I want you to understand is this is how interpreters work. You have a tree, you recurse through it, and then you evaluate. Okay, that's it. That's all that interpreters are doing. Okay? The same rules will apply to a more complex interpreter, like a Python interpreter, just that the AST is a bit more complicated. You will have some more structures for representing function calls, for representing objects, classes, etc. But the basic idea is something like this. You have this recursion going on over this AST. Okay? So using this, life is actually quite good. It's actually quite easy, easy to write this thing. It's not that hard to write. And my source code is now portable. That means I can give anyone a Python file. They can, as long as they have an interpreter available, they can run it, right? They just need an interpreter available for that. I don't need to worry about all those binary compatibility issues I had to worry about earlier on. And the best part is it's easy to write. We wrote it in two slides. It's quite easy to write this kind of thing. And the compilation, so to speak, is faster because there's no compilation at all. It's all happening at runtime, and there's no code generation step happening here. So all that expensive code generation optimization stuff, we can avoid it now. OK. But as you can expect, performance is shit, right? So I want you to focus on something. Focus on this expression, x plus 5. Let's say you have a programming language, any programming language. OK? You have this ex sub-expression, x plus 5. What's the most efficient way to represent this operation? If you think about it from a compile language point of view, it's just an assembly instruction, right? It's one instruction, add 5 to some register. Maybe you have one more instruction to move something to that register, but that's it. It's just one assembly instruction. But if you think about it, what's happening in the interpreted case, you're doing all these things for this expression. You're going to lex it, you're going to parse it, then you're going to execute it. And that's a lot of work. That's actually a lot of instructions. If you don't believe me, uh, this is like the same thing that I showed you guys earlier, the loop, the execution loop. I'm just showing the relevant branches here. And I want you to focus on this thing, that these two recursive calls are happening here. I'm going to execute this thing, and then it's going to go through here. Like This loop is expensive for that sub-expression. If you still don't believe me, this is what the code looks like just for that sub-expression. These are all the instructions that need to happen for you just to add 
that 5 to that x. All this needs to happen. And you can see why it's expensive. Interpreters kind of suck that way. It's not performance is going to be quite crap. So how do, we, and how do we fix this? The answer is virtual machines. Why? So the basic problem is that the, our representation of the program using an AST is not optimized for execution. It's optimized for representation, but it's not optimized for execution. So we come up with a different model of how to optimize for execution. And what we do is we use this concept called virtual machine. So a virtual machine is just like a, it's a machine to model the execution of a program. It's just a code. So the idea here is that you convert your source program into this thing called bytecode. Okay? A bytecode is like a, it's just instruction format that you define. And it's a useful abstraction that helps you keep portability. Because it's your bytecode format, your runtime, your virtual machine can then run it on any platform. So you still keep portability and you can still get improvement, improvement in uh, execution time. So let me give you an example of everyone's favorite, with everyone's favorite language. I'm going to use Python over here. So if, I don't know if you guys know this, but if you use Python and you import this uh, disassembler thingy, you can then generate the uh, bytecode instructions. Okay. So if I do the same thing for x plus 5, I can see that there's like these four instructions. But what do these mean? What's happening here? It's actually quite simple. So Python's virtual machine is stack-based. First thing you need to know. There's a stack. In, so just imagine there's a stack somewhere. Okay? It's called the evaluation stack. Load name, you see the first thing, load name here? J and there's an X on the side. Just means, hey bro, load the value of X on the evaluation stack. That's it. That's all it does. Load constant means push 5 on the evaluation stack. Binary add means pop the two items from the stack and push the result of adding them. That's it. You can see there's a stack. All these operations are happening on the stack. And that's it. So that's all there is. And at the end of it, you'll get some result from the stack. That's how most VMs work. JVM works in a very similar way. There's lots of different bytecodes for doing other things. But that's the gist of it. Okay? There's, this, there's this concept of a stack. And the stack is evaluating stuff. So you can imagine it's relatively more efficient. If I were to show you the diagram of what's happening now, previously we just were running thing directly. Now what's happening actually is we're doing some parsing. After the parsing, we will generate bytecode. In this example, like I'm showing the PYC thing is bytecode. And at runtime instead, I will feed this PYC thing, this bytecode into a Python VM, and the VM will then execute on the CPU. Okay? So what does the VM look like in code? Let's write a VM in two slides. I'm sorry to push you guys through this, put you guys through this. But a bytecode is, like a VM is even simpler than an AST. Like, so a VM basically just means, so like we're gonna, do, we're gonna do a very, very simple VM. We just have like three instructions, three bytecodes to load a variable, to load a constant, and to load an add, to do an add. Here I have the various, this struct will define what, like what, what's a, def, what structure of a bytecode. It's just, it knows what type it is and it has some arguments, okay? And when you execute a bytecode, it's very simple. You just create some stack over here, and based on the type, you iterate through the bytecode, and based on the type of bytecode, you do certain things. Like if it's a load variable, you push the value of that thing on the stack. If it's a load constant, you push the value of the constant on the stack. If it's an add, you pop from the stack, and then you push the result of adding them. Very simple stuff. You can imagine the code that this thing will generate will be smaller, and it will be faster, right? And if I do the same thing, in fact, it is. So this is the code generated using Clang and uh, for this particular example. And you can see that it's relatively small. I'm cheating a bit here, but it's relatively small. right? Compared to the previous example, it was like two pages. If two pages worth of assembly code is any uh, measure of how complex something is, this is like on half a page. So it, we've improved at least two times, which is not bad. Okay? This is sort of why run, uh, VMs can be faster. There's no recursive calls happening here. That's the main thing. The thing is ON. OK. So, so far, so good. We have a VM, right? Uh, and we've improved our interpreters, and we have portability. So we have better performance in the dumb interpreter. It's still portable F. And the problem still is that the performance is still nowhere near the compiled version. OK? The big problem here is that compiled code can do a lot of optimizations that aren't just possible with just bytecode. They aren't possible. And why is that? And 
the one of the major reasons why is that is if you have like a hot loop, imagine that your x plus 5 thing just now, I showed you the half page thing was inside a loop. That thing is going to happen for every iteration of the loop. So it's still kind of expensive. And how can we improve this thing? The idea here is very simple then. So we show, we sh I showed you compile languages. I showed you interpreters, bytecode interpreters. Why don't we combine them both, right? That's the classical way to solve problems. So finally, we're going to talk about JIT now, OK? So what is, it, what is a JIT? JIT means just-in-time compilation. And the basic idea is actually quite simple. The idea here is we will identify the hot parts of your code. For example, if a function is inside a loop or a function is being used a ton of times, we will identify it. We'll say, OK, this guy is hot. He's super hot, right? Then we're going to transform that guy into, a mach into machine code at runtime. And then we're going to optimize the shit out of, that run out of that machine code. And what we're going to do then is we're going to hot swap the implementation from the runtime one with the uh, super optimized sexy one at runtime dy dynamically, OK? And profit. That's all. That's the gist of what JIT, inter JIT compilers do. So I'm going to look at it slightly more concrete. So here's the flow chart of what's happening when JIT finally enters the scene. So you have your Python VM, right? The VM is executing. Because the VM is executing, it knows what is hot. It calls a function. It sees, hey, bro, this function was called 1,000 times. It's quite hot. It's, it's in need. So what, what can I do with it? Let's optimize it. So it's going to transfer it to the JIT. And the JIT will generate some machine code instructions instead. And those machine code instructions will be executed on the CPU instead of using the VM-based bytecode instructions. And that particular component will become quite fast. That's the whole idea behind JIT. Okay? So what are the kind of optimizations that are possible because of JIT? Well, there's actually quite a few. And this is a very big body of research. But basically, you can do things like inlining. You can expand a function call. So you take a function call, you expand it, remove the call part, and just expand the body inside. This can allow a lot of optimizations. You can do things like register allocation. So you know like registers are orders of magnitude faster than directly accessing memory. And this is something, if you have a native compiler that's compiling instructions directly, you can know what registers are free right now and what, how, what registers you can use. And therefore, you can do this kind of optimization. You can do instruction scheduling. So you know most CPUs are pipelined. Those of you who did computer engineering will probably know this, that how pipelining works. Like, so certain CPU architectures will pipeline certain instructions certain ways. And your, CPU and your compiler can take advantage of that. It knows that, hey, this construction follows this one in the pipeline. So if I schedule these right, all these can happen in parallel. So, and that will improve performance by a lot. It can do this thing called constant folding, which means if you have two constants, it can propagate the ex expression that uses them and convert that into a constant and then pass this all the way up the tree. It can do this fancy thing called common sub-expression elimination, which just means it basically finds redundant code and removes it. And it can eliminate dead code. So a lot, some of these optimizations can be done without JIT on bytecode as well. But a lot of these require you to have access to direct native instructions, because some of these are hardware-based. There are many, many more. There's like 20 years, 50 years of compiler research that's gone into building proper compilers. So the basic idea in JIT is that we can use that body of research and use it to improve our interpreter languages. OK? So the basic problem or the basic trade-off thing that you need to think about when you're doing JIT is execution versus compilation speed. Because even though you're comp when you're compiling at runtime, you're, you're consuming some cost. You're taking time to compile this thing. So you need to decide when, it's the right, when is the right time to compile it. So it's a trade-off. So JIT compilation can be quite slow. The compilation itself is quite slow. Because I mean, you're doing the same thing that native compilers are doing. You're doing all that code generation. You're doing all, the, all those optimization steps. It can be quite slow. So you don't want to do this all the time. So for interpreted languages especially, this is a problem. It can lead to a very large initial delay. So for example, you have a shell script, right? You don't want to wait for JIT to fire up and optimize the shit out of the shell script, because by the time you, it's done, your shell script is done executing anyway. Right? You don't want to do that. Or let's say you have a web page, and you fire some one-off script that's doing some analysis work, or that's going to do just one thing at load time when the DOM renders. 
You don't want that to be slow because then your customer is going to give you the middle finger for, for freezing his machine. Like you don't want to spend, waste your consumer's time. You want the initial render to be quite fast. So you don't want to do JIT all the time. It's not a magic bullet. So what's, how do we fix this idea, fix this problem? The idea is very simple. You only use JIT for hot code, like I mentioned previously. So you only, you try to find parts of the code that it makes sense to use JIT for, and then you only JIT those parts. That way you get quite a bit of flexibility and you still keep your fast initial run times. So as a case study, we can look at Web, WebKit's JavaScript core. Uh, who's familiar with WebKit? Anyone use WebKit before? Okay, actually all of you have, you guys are liars. All of you guys use WebKit. Because all of you have used Chrome once upon a time, and most of you probably have used Safari, they were all based on WebKit. Chrome these days forked off, but that's a different story. Okay, so JavaScript core is the JavaScript engine inside WebKit. It's used predominantly by Safari these days, so most people who use iOS will use this. Uh, and what the way it works is it provides multiple levels of JIT for different use cases. So they have this thing called a low-level interpreter, which is this optimized for, the, for your fast startup use case. They have a baseline JIT, which will remove the interpreter overhead like we discussed. So it'll just be compiled, but it won't do any big optimization, so it's still kind of fast. And then they have this super complicated data flow graph JIT thingy, which is like fully optimized, designed for crazy high throughput kind of loads. And this is like what the diagram looks like. So what's gonna happen is functions get promoted from your low level interpreter to your baseline JIT or to your DFG JIT and so, so on and so forth. Like to look at this in slightly more detail, what's going to happen is, let's say you have a function in JavaScript. Let's say you call that function six times, or some statement in that function is called 100 times. That function will be promoted. We know this guy is a big, is a big bad boy. He needs to go to baseline JIT now. He, needs, he, he cannot survive in low-level interpreter mode. So he will, that function will be promoted. And if the function is called 66 times or 1,000, has a thousand repeated statements inside, he's a better boy, so he'll go to DFG JIT, and uh, he'll, be, he'll be a real badass. The performance will be quite good. The a priori assumption made here is that the current frequency of function call is a good predictor of future frequency. So if a function's being called a lot right now, there's a good chance it'll be called a lot in the future. That's why it makes sense to do this trade-off and spend time compiling it to JIT. And the beautiful, beautiful black magic thing here is they can do this at any statement boundary. So what that means is midway through the function, no matter where you are in the function, they can promote it. No matter where you are, the whole runtime state will be consistent and it'll be fine. And they can promote, de-promote as well. So if they think that JIT is not worth it or some assumptions they made is not, is not, are, are, are unqualified, they can de-promote it back. This is beautiful. They call this all stack replacement. It's quite, it's quite sexy, I think. So some more things about JavaScript core. If you think about JavaScript as an untyped language, so you need type information to compile efficient code, right? I have this function foo does a, b, 42, a plus b is 42. What, is, what are a and b? It's JavaScript, could be a string, empty array, empty object, fun to see what happens if that happens, if that, you have that kind of code, right? But it cannot be, who knows? No one knows. So how does the DFG JIT know what type it is? So here's the bright idea. The low-level interpreter and baseline JIT, because they already run this function so many times, they will keep profiles on the variable and they will store what type it is. So they'll be like, hey bro, I know that A is an int or that B is a string. So I can do the speculation and if the speculation is wrong, I can always fall back to the baseline JIT and not use the super optimized version because my, my assumption was wrong. But if my assumption is right, then it's great. I mean, the, I'll use the nice profile version. So this is like sort of what it looks like. The type in, so the uh, low-level interpreter and the baseline JIT will do these type inferences, and the, these things will help prof the performance by quite a lot. Okay. Last thing, last another small case study is PyPy versus C Python. I don't think many people use PyPy. I don't know how many of you do it, do use it, but you guys should check it out. It's quite cool. So PyPy is a JIT compiler for Python written in Python. Yo, dog. Right, it's quite, it's quite awesome. So C Python is the boring old version that everyone uses. It's the default implementation, and actually, it's a bytecode interpreter. You guys know what a bytecode interpreter is by now. I showed you guys one earlier. It's just say interpreter generates bytecode, then you have a VM that will run that bytecode. Okay, it's actually quite straightforward. It's just it's pretty well optimized over the last few 
10, 20 years, however long it's been out. PyPy is seven times faster than CPython, though. And that's quite a bit. And that's quite, quite an achievement if you think about it, how long CPython's been out. And why is it so much faster? It's because it's a JIT. And actually, PyPy is quite interesting. I recommend you check out there's a few papers the author wrote. It's a meta JIT in the sense that it will apply the JIT strategy to an interpreter in, instead of the source program, which makes the implementation a lot simpler. I just pass you a link to the paper later. It's very interesting to read how they did it. It's very, very meta. OK, so conclusion. Out of from all that talk, the principle behind JIT, like I promised, is actually quite easy. It's a very simple principle. Compile native code during runtime for hot sections. That's it. That's all that JITs are doing. Something JITs always do. Use JVM will do this. PyPy will do this. All your JavaScript engines, V8, JavaScript core, they all do this kind of approach. The main thing you have to balance is execution time versus startup time. So if you want startup time to be fast, you probably don't want to use JIT. If you want execution time to be fast, and you don't mind sacrificing startup time, you can use JIT. This is a balance that all these uh, compilers have to draw. The big problem is real world JITs are very, very complex. So like, like JavaScript core is one beast. And if you look at any JIT compiler, it's, it's very, very complex in the real world because there's a lot of things that they need to, to handle. So that if you guys are interested, here's a few links. I'll put my slides up somewhere later on. So there's a few links by WebKit on how they implemented the JIT. And this, this here's the paper I was talking about. It's very interesting. It's called a tracing JIT that PyPy uses. It's a very interesting technique because it's an easy way to write a JIT, but it's, uh, it uses, it, you, the JIT doesn't have to be handcrafted, basically. It, so it's, a, it's quite a general approach. And obviously Wikipedia. So without further ado, let's jump to Q&A. No pun intended. Thank you, Omar. <laughs> Yeah, Melvin. Hello. Yeah, so this section is like quite complicated thing to write. It's almost like a compiler already. Yes, it is. So, but there isn't many projects where they have a JIT and then they also like release a compiler based on the JIT. Why, why is that? So? Okay, so not exactly. There is. So JavaScript core, right? For example. JavaScript core is an example here. So one of the so JavaScript core, one of the techniques they use to optimize your machine code in the different like so they have these three baseline levels, right? There's actually a fourth based fourth level of JIT they use. It's called it's based on based off LLVM. So what they'll use is they'll use if you know how LLVM works, LLVM has a front end and a back end. The back end will convert LLVM IR into machine code. So they use this, they use that thing. So they'll use LLVM LLVM's back end and they'll connect that to their JIT. So Basically, if you reach a certain level of performance, they'll use LLVM backend and use the same optimization that LLVM has done, and they'll use that to generate machine code. So the, the idea here is to reuse some of the advanced functionality that LLVM has already done. So a lot of the techniques that they use are already built by compilers. So there is quite a bit of duplication. At like, so a lot of JIT compilers will duplicate a lot of things that real compilers do. Some of them will try to use some common infrastructure like LLVM. These days, no one writes a real compiler anymore, Sai. Like, because everyone, everyone just uses LLVM, because LLVM will do that thing for you. So uh, there are efforts to combine them, like I said. But most JITs will be, like many JITs will be handwritten. But they'll try to use the same kind of optimization that native compilers do use. Uh, I think my question was, why doesn't JavaScript core release a JavaScript compiler? Oh, I see. So it's a good question. So you mean like this pure native, right? Purely native compile. Yeah, like you give it a JavaScript code, it gives you like a binary. Okay, that's a good, actually that's a good question. Why it doesn't do that? That's a good question. Yeah, that's, that's, something, to, that's something to wonder about actually. <laughs> it's something to wonder about, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, you'd have to ask Web, WebKit why they don't do that. I suspect it's a use case thing. Yeah, I, maybe there, in which example would you have a case where you execute something that's compiled in JavaScript, like a JavaScript binary? Yeah, maybe. You could, I guess Node.js guys could profit from that. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Well, I actually, uh, thank you, thank you for talking about the JIT. Uh, my background is actually in uh, electronics, so I'm not really a computer scientist. So what I'm trying to understand is, uh, is there any like uh, uh, physical applications that you can you can uh, see? Because uh, 
by the time it reaches my hands, right? I, I'm like I'm usually the hands-on guy. Uh, I, I do the implementation and all. So I, I don't know how I can apply this. Uh, is is there is there any application you can think of that can be applied in the real world? Ah uh, ah. Uh, so so the lessons from this talk can be yeah. applied to the real world. Well, well, if you're writing a JIT compiler, that's quite useful. Yes. <laughs> but if you're not writing a compiler in time soon, I guess the main thing this helps with is helps you understand why your performance might be slow. So like if you're writing Python code, for example, if you write Python code as, and if you're wondering why is your Python code not performing the way it is, you could tune your code to optimize, make full use of the JIT. If you know that, oh, there's a JIT compiler inside, and that thing can optimize if needed, if you give it the right kind of hints, or if you like, provided the like, right information. So it depends on your use case, but general idea is it's good to know how your tools work in order to make full benefit of your tools. So uh, because uh, in engineering applications, right, we still use uh, C. Okay. We also use like uh, Oh yeah, fair enough. Okay, fair enough. If you if you use C, you don't need to worry about this. This talk is not exactly for you because you're in, you're good. You're using compiled languages. So welcome to my world. Like okay. you're 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 good. You're good to go. Yeah. So a question over there, Harish. Uh, yeah. Very quick question. In one sentence, what is it that you are able to say about why PyPy is seven times better than C Python? It can apply all the optimizations from compiler research on generating machine code because it's a JIT. That C Python cannot because it's operating by code. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Any more questions? Okay, all right. Uh, just a reminder that Microsoft is having. Oh, sorry, thank you, Omar. Uh, First, thank you thank so you. much.